Well, my name is uh, Martha Cotton. When I enlisted in the uh, Women Marines, I was Martha Minnick. I enlisted in 1943. Everywhere you went, you'd see these posters, you know, Uncle Sam wanted, wanted us. <laughs> and they definitely wanted women to replace men so that men could go be sent overseas. They wouldn't send us overseas. We were to uh, enlisted to replace a man so that he could go overseas. And it, it was quite an experience just <laughs> to go and then be around a, a lot of other women that were enlisting as well. It was different than anything. <laughs> but I'd always been an early riser, <clears throat> which is a good thing, because uh, at 6 o'clock every morning, we had to fall out on the parade ground and uh, uh, go through our calisthenics. <laughs> so well, that was, uh, but that's been an experience that has really f f followed me the rest of my life. In the squad room I was in, I imagine there were 80 women from all over the United States. And you made friends and uh, you were kept very busy and you just didn't have time to <laughs> get homesick or anything. <laughs> after, after boot camp, I was uh, to receive orders of where I was, what I was to do. But uh, until they came, they put me on KP. So I was put in the kitchen where the women ate. We had our, at that time, our, the women's area was uh, fenced off. It was all separate and we had our own mess hall. At, I was in boot camp in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. And when, we, when I got my orders to go to uh, paymaster school or to, uh, to work in the pay office after the school, uh, I left from Camp Lejeune, North Carolina on a, the train and uh, we went to Los Angeles and then we, I transferred to another train and went to San Diego. I worked in the pay office. The pay office I worked in, there was a man that lived in, um, he lived in an area of Los Angeles, and he had a car. See, you didn't have, you know, transportation or anything. You went on buses. <laughs> and he, and so he took some of us to, to LA. But he had a lot of experiences. <laughs> My one brother was stationed at what they called Jack's Farm, which was, close to San Diego, and this was a, uh, a farm where the Marines learned how to drive tanks. This was, he was in the tank corps. Mm -hmm. One time a uh, submarine pulled into San Diego and uh, you could go and tour it. I went to tour that submarine because I wanted to see, I was curious to see what it was like. and. Uh, I tell you, after I did that, uh, I really had a lot of respect for anybody that served in the submarine, right. because uh, I don't think I could have stood that <laughs> to be to be in those quarters, close quarters, underwater all that time. Another time, a uh, aircraft carrier came into San Diego, and I got to go see that and go on board, wow. and uh, I was amazed how large it was. It, it seemed like the deck was about the size of a football field. It was huge. <laughs> I, I do think the experiences that we enjoyed at that time are something that young people uh, would be interested in. And uh, I saw parts of the country I had never seen. I met people from a lot of different walks of life. I'm Gwen Gillis. <laughs> I was Gwen Price when I went in the service. Mm -hmm. I didn't like shorthand or stenography. <laughs> I went into motor transport, which did not give promotions. Now she'll tell you she got quite. I didn't tell him my rank. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't. I got one. And I drove the officers around. I drove a bread truck. I drove a pickup truck. I drove a dump truck with the prisoners in it to take them out to take the trash out. You weren't allowed to talk to them, 
but that didn't stop us. We stopped, we <laughs> so there was a lot of discipline. Mm -hmm. And we had our own barracks, and our own PX, and all. But we liked to go down to the other one, you know, and that. But all the fellows were nice to us, and uh, they gradually left. And it was mostly women there then. And one time, we wanted to go to a picnic. Mm -hmm. So the fellow was an ambulance driver, and he pulled down the lower end of the compound. And one by one, we snuck out, went and got in the back of the ambulance, <laughs> and went to the picnic. We <laughs> laid down so nobody could see us. And that's how we got to the picnic. Uh, we had a lot of experiences. We went to Savannah, Georgia. We went over to Buford. And, oh, I forgot to say, I stayed in on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. She went to the West. I saw a lot of things there. I was at Paris Island, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so did you enjoy those uh, early morning calisthenics as much as she did? No. <laughs> Five o'clock in the morning, get up and down and up and down. <laughs> and then afterwards go to class, mm -hmm. <coughs> mm -hmm. then get out on the drill field and try to stay in line. <laughs> I, I liked the drill field. I mm -hmm. did too. I was in a quick drill platoon. Mm -hmm. huh? I was in a quick drill platoon. Oh, well, I wasn't. We, we performed, at, one time we performed at uh, a football game in, at intermission at USC, oh, wow. and I got to see that football field. <laughs> First yeah. time I'd ever been there. <laughs> We've enjoyed knowing each other. Yes, we mm -hmm. have, really, truly. Because uh, we have a lot of stories we can share. Yes, right. <laughs> My name is Raymond Randall. I was staff sergeant. I had fed, fed the troops. We were field artillery, 155 howitzers. And those 155 howitzers was on the front lines. Usually you'd have them in the back, but they didn't want them. We shot point blank, straight ahead. Went all the way up through Italy to Florence. I was five miles from Florence, and they pulled us out, and we made this an invasion of southern France at Nice. And then we went from Nice all the way up through France, around the corner into Czechoslovakia, where the war ended. <coughs> it's not easy to talk about. Uh, of course, I guess I was one of the lucky ones, as far as that goes. It was the first show I ever heard. And then, whew, 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 I was in the garbage pit. <laughs> Captain said to me, Randall, any holes good? I said, yes, sir, they all are nice holes. <laughs> because if you didn't, you'd stand up there, you, you're gone. My last days were pretty nice. We got ready to come home. It was one of us. First was to get back home because we was over there first. And I gave a pair of my army boots and my army raincoat, which I got from the Navy who had the best raincoats. And I gave that to a Russian boy and told him good luck. He didn't know whether he could find his family or not. <coughs> so I gave that to him. Because I had an extra pair. Some of us didn't know what it was all about. Throw your gun and say, let's go, boy. <laughs> you better get moved, too. <laughs> but it wasn't bad. But I mean, you don't get babied. You grow up fast. And I mean fast, if you want to survive. You know, you make it through, but even though I was in artillery, we were in the back of the infantry. We were that close with them big guns. And we fired them point blank lots of times. But uh, what do you do? You have to do what you're supposed to do and try to get out, try to you know, hope that you can make it out of the war. Um, 
it's not easy. No war is, I don't believe. Because when you got a, well, there's a couple back there, the girls and some of these boys are all together. So there, there's lots, there was some good things I learned from it and there was some bad things I learned from it, you know. But um, I wouldn't want to add, put it on anybody. And especially, I thought they were just heavy set. But young girls, about your all ages, were pregnant. You know, it's, it's, it ain't no pretty thing to see. And I don't know, it, it is, it's hell, pure hell. That's all I can tell you. Well, we were kids, mm -hmm. really. Of course, I was 20 years old. Some of them were 18, 17, but uh, it ain't pretty. And it ain't pretty to see the ones that's being bombed and shelled, some of them crippled, and you see little kids coming up to them. You have to give them your food. You can't let them walk away without having something to eat. So you give it and do it without yourself. I mean, easy. Because your houses are all blown up. Kids are running around the street looking for their parents. Can't find them. They carried, um, well, like a bean can or a green bean can, tomato cans. Give them something to eat. Help them. Mm -hmm. Give them something. War is hell. And I mean hell. When you see young girls and young boys that's no bigger than 10, 12 years old. Don't know where their parents are. Standing. With a tin can waiting for you to give them something to eat. Now that's damn hard to take. And I don't care who you are, you can't take it. And a lot of us fellows gave our food to them because they were standing there like that, and I'm, I'm sorry, that's, that's it, it's hell. George Hower, 1943 to 1945, I was drafted. I went to Denver, Colorado to gunnery school, armored gunner, and bomber, B-26, Martin Marauder. Well, they were a fast airplane, but they were hard to fly. They were hard to get off the ground. They had a narrow wing, and uh, as a matter of fact, that the engineers used to build us a chute at the end of the runway. I was in southern England most of the time. I went over on to Queen Mary in December of 43, and went down to, to Ipswich, southern England, is where our air base was. Yes, I flew 54 missions all together. Yeah. They didn't give a damn how many you <laughs> served in the Ninth Air Force. A lot of those missions are decoy missions. We went most of the time without an escort. We, a lot of our mission was just to draw the enemy fighters away from the B-17s, the Eighth Air Force. That's what we called decoy. We'd fly up towards Norway and Sweden. Yeah, I was a tail gunner. I seen, I didn't see where I was going, but I could see where in the hell I was. I flew backwards all the time. Uh, how long were you uh, stationed in southern England? Oh, until I got shot down six days after D-Day. Well, we were just on a regular mission. We was bombing uh, marshalling yards, railroad yards, and stuff like that. We got hit right outside of Paris when the Germans still occupied it. We took a direct hit on the one engine. The bomber was in only a two-engine bomber, B-26. And uh, the pilot told us we want to try to make it back to any channel because we had air rescue in the channel all the time. And we kept losing altitude. He told us we could either bail out or ride it down. So we decided to come ride it down. 
take an emergency landing. And, and, uh, we come down, but made a belly landing. And we didn't get slowed down, and we kept it going. We must be going about 80 miles an hour yet when we hit a fence row. You know, a hedgerow, what they call a hedgerow over in York. Hit one of them and back up the air we went. And they come down. And my buddy was with me. Him and I laid on the, uh, all the floor in the airplane, their feet up against the bomb bay doors. And then when you come down in the woods on the other side of that hedgerow, the plane broke in two. And it threw Tommy and I out. The 82nd Airborne picked me up, took me to La Havre, put me on a hospital ship back to England. I was in the hospital for almost three months. Well, I had eight vertebrae fractured, uh, collarbone, shoulder, arm, and a leg fractured. Now, uh, how many survived the crash? Just two of us. Five died. This is my last mission, yes. My outfit moved over into France, and I, and I went back over there. I stayed with them till right before the war was over. Now, uh, what would you do as you're on base? Would you help out with? Uh, I just clean guns and repair machine guns, whatever they had for me to do. I mostly go on pass, going to Paris or someplace. And Dan was telling me about the buzz bombs. They had buzz bombs. We've seen quite a few of them. But they would make a droning noise at night when they come over, like a, somebody moaning or groaning. And then when that stopped, <laughs> you put your, God, your life in God's hand or something, because you didn't know where it was coming down. The whole thing come down just blew it up. Well, sometimes at nighttime we'd man the f machine guns and stuff. I got some pictures and we shot down a Ju-88 one night. It lit right outside of our barracks. There's two German pilots in it. Both got killed. I got a picture of it. I got a picture of my buddy with a pistol, like he shot the plane down with his pistol. Uh, it sailed on December the 2nd of 45. And uh, the boat I was on was USS Milford Victory Ship. It leaned over to run about two feet of water in the bottom of the boat. Everything we had got soaking wet. <laughs> I went in there in 1940 and stayed till 1946. So when I got there, when I got there, and uh, we were standing in line, there was 200 people out there, and uh, this guy was sitting up on, stood up on the bench there, and, and he was saying, now you'll be assigned to where you'll be going. So anyway, uh, he said, uh, we need uh, 12 cooks. So it, nobody stuck their hand up. He said, well, we'll do it the Army way. He said, you, you, and you, and you, and I was one of the yous. And that saved my life. So uh, we got over there and landed in England, and uh, we took some more basic training. They, they, we spent 10 days there, and then they said, uh, they came in there about 5 or 6 o'clock, they came along, and they said, uh, just leave everything here, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're being shipped out. At that time, that was in, for, that was in for England, then, uh, then, we, then we, they, they said, we're going to take put you into France. There was a big battle going on. The, line, uh, the, uh, the, the Germans at that time mm -hmm. made, their, made their last spill about winning the war when I got on that ship. And we were sailing for France. We got uh, within five miles of, uh, of our destination there, and, uh, and uh, we got torpedoed. This, this big ship uh, held uh, 3,000 troops on there. I was down at the bottom, me and my cooks there, and my second cook there, a little short guy, his name was Charlie something, I can't remember his name now. But anyhow, I said, uh, we gotta go upstairs. There were six flights up to the top deck. Well, when you get up to the top deck, where this, where this bomb had come in, it was just big as this room, big, a hole in the, in the side of the ship, and, 
and over the loudspeaker was saying, abandon ship, we're going to abandon ship. Well, it was uh, five or six, seven o'clock at night, and uh, it's pitch dark, no lights, no nothing, and they want us to abandon ships, and where did we go? We jump in the water, hope somebody picks us up. Between being torpedoed there, with that there torpedo that uh, sunk us, mm -hmm. and uh, then jumping in the water, and there was a loss of life. Out of our 3,000, we lost 800 of our buddies that night. And uh, I got uh, up on top there, me and Charlie, and uh, I looked on the, along that rail, and there was uh, all these lifeboats was gone. There was only one left up at the top here, and it was about from here to that wall over there, a good 25, 30 feet. So I said, Charlie, I said, uh, gee whiz, this, this, this is empty, I wonder why. As we sat in there about five or ten minutes, here comes uh, two, two, two uh, Belgian seamen. They were the ones that run this, this, the, the boat we were on. And uh, in broken English, he told us to get out of there because that was saved, that, was, that ship was, the uh, reason why it was there and empty, it was for the crew. So we get out and stood alongside the fence. Now, you, now you're, you're, you're on a sinking ship, and over the loudspeakers tend to abandon ship, or, you know, we're going to sink. You know, you're, you're, you're trying to save your life. And uh, I said to Charlie, I said, my God, I said, uh, well, these people are crazy. They're telling us to jump there. Where the hell are we going to jump at in this water? And if we're lucky, somebody will pick us up. And, and, and at that time, it was Christmas Eve of 1944, freezing weather. And if you hit that water, you only last about 20 minutes, and, uh, you know, it'd kill you. And uh, on the board that ship, uh, I mean, there was bodies and sick people and people, they got the... Uh, arms missing and legs missing from the torpedo. And, and I said, Charlie, I said, let's, get, let's not get rid of near them. I said, we can't help them people. And I, I said, uh, but they got the medics there and the, the, the crew, and they were, they were taking care of that. I said, let's get on this here. And, I, and, and it got to the point where it, it was, there was a little thing called survival. So you, you, you was on your own. So Charlie and I, we went buddied up because if something would happen to me, he'd take care of me, so he said, and I'd take care of him, so I said. Now, as we were talking and arguing with these two people here, an, an English destroyer came alongside, and, uh, and uh, they were way up at the front there, they threw the line there, and like I said, it was survival time, and, uh, and I said to Charlie, I said, we're gonna, let's, let's, let's jump on that board. The, when it starts going down, we'll jump on there. They can't put us off then. So they, them two, they got, they got on there and they took our seat that was on, the, on, the, on, the, on that boat. And five minutes later, they were dead. What had happened was, when, 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 these, when this ship come to, to come on us, this, this, the, our people was supposed to be our salvation, they put, came in there, there they, would, uh, they would take and, uh, and, uh, and uh, push, push the water up. Well, when they pushed it up, when they put it, when it down, it created the, the, the line there. And the, 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 when that boat came in, it crushed this boat, because them boats in them days was made out of wood. And it was not a metal and the stuff like that that they have today. Then uh, we jumped, uh, then the English, two on Yanks jump, it says, you didn't do that, so we did it. So we got as far as the, 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 the rail, and we both of them, we grabbed the rail, well, uh, the funny part about it was when we, get, when we was ready to jump, I said to Charlie, I said, uh, you go first, I said, uh, and I'll follow. He said, why, why don't you go for it? No, I said, I want to see if you make it. I, that was a silly thing to say because the, the dang going ship was sinking, you know, Everybody, we had to get off of there. So anyway, uh, so we decided to both jump at the same time, so that's what we did. Both of us jumped, and we grabbed the hold of this rail, and then the uh, English sailors, they, pulled, they t took us and uh, pulled us in there and gave us a, a blanket. But uh, anyhow, the, them two guys uh, landed in the water. And when, when I looked down there to see their bodies down there, one of them was, one of them was down like this, uh, and the other was on his back like this. And, the, and they, they floated out to sea. Now, the, the, the end of this uh, thing was uh, about three times of this distance here. And, uh, and we watched their bodies go f floating down there, shaking like a leaf, because, you know, somebody saved us, and uh, they took our place, and they got killed, and uh, we were still alive. And that's how we survived that. Uh, I'm Glenn Stewart. 
I was in uh, the Army artillery in uh, Europe. I was drafted, 1944, in Cumberland. In Cumberland. I was in high, Allegheny High School. I was drafted out of high school. I, I had a, a 10 days uh, delay in route, and I went to Fort Miles Standish in Massachusetts and shipped out from there uh, on Christmas Eve. And uh, we went out to sea in the dark. And uh, looking back, I saw America fading in the distance as, as we, we left. And that was rough, especially that time of year. You just don't like leaving home. We, uh, <clears throat> we were the only, only ship. Uh, and there was no group. We weren't in convoy because I was on the uh, USS uh, Her Majesty's ship. It's an uh, English ship. Uh, the Aquitania it was the uh, second largest ship afloat at the time. It was a very fast ship, so they knew that they could outrun submarines. So they they ran that by itself, and it wasn't in convoy. And it took us seven days to go across. And we went into uh, Scotland Harbor, and uh, and then we went right down through England on a train through London and uh, down to Southampton. The next night, we were out in the mid middle of the uh, English Channel, and uh, the lights were out. They killed the engines, and uh, there was no talking, no, no noise. It had to be very quiet because there were submarines in the, in the area, but they couldn't find us in the dark unless there was noise. And so then when it, uh, in daylight, in the morning, they uh, fired up the engines and we went into La Havre ha uh, Harbor at, uh, in France. I uh, came through the Battle of the Bulge. It was the big experience of, of my career in the Army. Uh, other than that, though, it was just the Battle of the Bulge and the Rhine River crossing and then what they called Central Europe. We went down into uh, uh, southern, southern Germany. They came through the line and, and made inroads into our, behind the lines. And uh, uh, what they did was, was they had American uniforms and they uh, tried to uh, infiltrate into our troops and to cause confusion and all. They took uh, road signs at crossroads and all and switched them all around so that you went in the wrong direction. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, our sister battalion was the battalion that was massacred at Malmedy. Now, anybody that studied the, the war uh, knows about the massacre at Malmedy where they took all these American soldiers and put them in a the field and then they come in with trucks, and uh, trucks had tarpaulins over the back. And when they got in place, they threw back all the tarpaulins and opened up with machine gun fire and just killed all the soldiers. Yeah, well, that was our that was our sister outfit. Uh, I've, I've forgotten what uh, what the uh, numerical designation of their name was, but uh, we got a uh, a young uh, lieutenant from that group that uh, played dead, and he, uh, he, he survived it, and he came and he was with our outfit then for the rest of the war. His name was Joe Katarski from uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A very nice young man, but uh, that's the only one I ever knew that come out of the uh, Malmody Massacre. Well, I, I didn't come uh, face to face at that time with a German soldier. I was in the back from the front somewhat. And uh, so I, I didn't have direct contact with the, with the German soldiers. I was in the artillery. But we did later on at the Rhine River crossing. We, uh, we <laughs> 
we located, they located us, and so uh, we had to uh, take care of that. The engineers had, had laid down a uh, pontoon bridge across the Rhine River, and uh, the, the uh, anti-aircraft was uh, set so that whenever they fired it, just put an umbrella of uh, artillery above the, the, the uh, bridge so that if the Germans uh, sent their airplanes in, when that went off, it was, they just flew into that anti-aircraft. They didn't have to seek them out. They just ran into it, and, uh, and that, so they didn't, uh, didn't fool around very much. But we were, we were bivouacked on a hill above the, uh, the uh, bridge the night before we crossed the bridge. And uh, all during the night, you could hear the ACAC, the anti aircraft, going off. And uh, it just wasn't a, wasn't a very good night's rest. It was uh, in the Moselle River Valley. We were in convoy uh, going down through the Moselle River Valley, and there was a big precipice on this side of the road, and on this side was the river. So you, you just had to stay in line. And all of our vehicles had uh, turrets, gun turrets on, 50 caliber gun turrets. And uh, I saw an airplane approaching us, and I looked up, and I couldn't identify it. And uh, I looked at it, and I, I knew it wasn't one of ours, and I couldn't even identify it as one of theirs. So I opened up fire on it, and about that time, some of the other guys woke up, and they opened up on it too. And, uh, and it, it, it turned and, and took off. And when it did, it was, it was strange because it was faster, more agile, and uh, just more threatening than any plane that we'd ever seen before. And of course, whenever we got together after we got to where we were going, uh, we were talking about what was that, what was that? And uh, nobody seemed to understand what it was, but it was a, certainly a special kind of an airplane. And then uh, about a week later, it came out in Stars and Stripes newspaper. Now, Stars and Stripes newspaper is a, a paper that was made just for the GIs. And uh, it told you the, the news, that, what they could tell. And they mentioned in there that the Germans were trying out a jet airplane. And that's what we had seen, never saw it before. It was the first, I guess, one of the very first jet airplanes that ever flew, I suppose. And, uh, but that, that's what we fired on that day. And that's why it was, is different, because your, your propeller planes just can't do what a jet does. And uh, it, was, it was kind of a hair-raising thing. It was about three months longer till the war was over, and that's where we we went through uh, the southern part of Germany, down into the uh, Czechoslovakian border, and that's where we ended up. And uh, I have I have some pictures of the uh, German army surrendering to us. I looked for them, but I couldn't find them. I don't. I don't know where they are. I looked and I looked. <laughs> well, that was that was where I was down on the in near Munich, Nuremberg, and uh, uh, close to Dachau, uh, the concentration camp, and the, where they murdered the Jews and all. I didn't. I wasn't personally there when they were, they were liberated, but it was you, uh, part of our unit was there, and uh, we did get some uh, young men who were Polish that were there to be murdered by the Nazis, but uh, they were liberated by our troops, and uh, they came and uh, did kitchen duty for us. And then even after the war was over, they stayed with us. After the war, I came home. I come home on a in a, on a uh, army ship, U.S. Army ship, a transport ship, the USS Braxton, and come into uh, New York Harbor. 
My name is Albert Rosley, and I'm a World War II veteran of the Navy. I enlisted October the 29th, 1942. I was a torpedo man, and they shipped us to Boston in Charlestown Navy Yard, and we put a ship in commission, the USS Spencer Commission, on January the 8th. 1943 was the destroyer was a 2100-ton destroyer. We had uh, a five-inch 38 main battery uh, guns. We had uh, about 10 40 millimeter guns, and probably about two dozen 20 millimeter guns. We were pretty well armed. And when we had uh, 10 torpedoes and uh, probably uh, 15 300 pound depth charges and about a dozen 600 pound depth charges that we, that the torpedo men took care of. Being in Don Walton, that I was the partnered with on number one tubes on the in on the Spence. He was a pointer and I was a trainer and we would crank in the problems in the uh, torpedo whether it run like uh, five foot deep in that with gyro angle to crank in on them and he cranked the problems in and I trained the, the tubes out over to to uh, fire the torpedoes. It's what you're trained to do it, uh, after a while, it just comes natural to you. The K guns, as far as the torpedoes or the depth charges over the side, you're out. And if you want uh, to set up the problems in them, they, you have a thing that you, that you turn to make them explode like at 100 feet and 125 or 150 feet. And we usually dropped a, a nine charge pattern if we had a submarine contact, we would drop, we would fire two side K guns and drop one at 300 pounds each of them, and we'd drop one three or 600 pound. You'd fire two and drop one and fire two and drop one. It was a nine pattern uh, depth charge for submarines. I'd remember one time we was going to pick up about a half a dozen Japanese that was in a little rubber lifeboat, and, and uh, it was we found out later it was a bomber crew that was shot down, and I think there was around six of them in there, and, and when we went to pick them up, by the officer, they had this machine gun. The officer stuck it in the one of their crew mouth, and they pulled the trigger. And there was all five of them went, and when he went to shoot himself with it, it misfired, and he got his side arms out and shot himself. And things like that, you uh, you don't never forget them. The ship went down on the December the 18th, 1944. Uh, we had hit a typhoon off the Philippines, and. Uh, on the 17th, we tried to fuel off to New Jersey, and we tried to fuel off of a sea tanker, and the seas was too rough, we couldn't fuel off of them, and we was light on fuel, and we was like, they had ballast, they'd pump seawater in to stabilize the ship, but when we was good to refuel, they pumped it all out, and we was like a cork, and real light, then on the morning of the 18th, we was in really in the storm. Uh, with some of the lowest barometric pressures that was ever recorded, it was something like uh, 29.83. On the morning of the 18th, we couldn't do nothing. And, and we finally, they finally l lost suction for the boilers where we had power and we lost power, and we lost electric power, and we got in a big trough, and uh, that's when the ship capsized. We had uh, something like uh, 340 on board, 
and there was 24 of us that survived it. We swam in that storm for about six hours after the ship went down. We had a floater net. It's about a 10 by 10, and it's made up out of cork with rope runs to them, and we was on that there, but it would roll up like a carpet in the big waves, 60, 70 foot waves, and it would roll up and throw you off, and you'd have to swim back. When you'd come up and top the water while you'd look around, the thing would be way down in the trough. You'd start swimming, and the next thing you know, it'd be way up in the wave. And uh, it was pretty hard swimming back to it sometimes. And we lost a lot of men. We started out with something like 26 on that, and when they picked us up, we had six left. We didn't have no food. Uh, we didn't have no water. We didn't have no nothing to eat. On the first night, in the first evening after the storm, storm quieted down, we had survivor kits on that what's called, but they had, later on they had broke loose and floated away. We had uh, uh, had uh, dive things that do, if any, like airplane come over, you break open a dive and it color up the water around you. We had all that stuff in survivor kits, but we lost them. The ship went down about quarter after 11 on the 18th. They picked us up uh, in the wee hours of the morning of the 20th. So it wasn't quite two days, I don't think, something like 46 hours or something, maybe less. The USS Ware, uh, DE, uh, Destroyer Escort, uh, they gave us a little bowl of uh, split pea soup and uh, put us to bed. And I didn't wake up to sometime after 5 o'clock that day. Uh, so I don't remember too much about that part of it. I had five days in the USS. Uh, Solus, the hospital ship, after they got us in the port. After our first night engagement at uh, the Battle of Espirito uh, at uh, Bougainville, uh, there was a plane come over to bomb us, and he dropped two bombs on the, on the uh, starboard quarter and one on the other quarter, and I was standing behind the torpedo tubes on the deck. But uh, the bomb that uh, they dropped on the uh, uh, port side, when it exploded, I felt something hit my dungarees there, and I didn't pay any attention to it. And later on, I looked at it, and it was just it didn't bleed much, just a little bit there, but it's always been in there. There for like 65 years, and I asked the doctor to take it out, and he asked, he said, does it bother you? I told him no, but uh, he said, forget it. So it's still in there. I like to see it sometime. And then uh, you notice if somebody gets sick on the ship where they pack up everything that they owned and put it, you know, and they ship, and then they wouldn't get back to the ship. And I thought, well, I didn't want to leave the ship, and it didn't bother me that much, so I just, I didn't tell anybody about it. And uh, well, different ones knew I had it in there, but the officers and that, they didn't know. That's been 65 years ago. You forget about a lot of stuff. But I enjoyed my time in the Navy. Uh, but, uh, and I think back, I kind of wished I would have stayed, but it didn't turn out that way. Well, I enlisted in the Air Force as a cadet in August of 43. I had a deferment to finish school, mm -hmm. finished high school, and on the 28th of January, I graduated. The 12th of February, I was in Fort Meade and for processing. We left there and went to Miami Beach for basic and processing for cadets. Mm -hmm. Well, while we were doing our processing for cadets, they closed it. So they said, you got three choices. You can go to gunnery school, gunnery school, or gunnery school. Pick one. 
and we spent a couple of days and got to visit places. In Cairo, we went to see the uh, pyramids, had picture taken in front of the Sphinx, and things like that, which I'll never forget. <laughs> we flew missions over Burma, uh, bombing missions. We fly uh, on uh, bridges, railroad sidings, supply dumps, boats, airfields, and then we also flew supplies to China. We fly gas and supplies over the hump to China. We had flak, we had small gun fire. We never had any fighter problems. Well, we've had several missions we were, but I guess the outstanding mission is the one we had when we packed the bridge on the River Kwai. That was our most memorable one. There'd been two attempts at the bridge before we tried it. Uh, we went in on a low level. And uh, when we come off the bridge, we had seven second delayed action bombs. But when we come off the bridge, I seen ours explode. And we took out one section of the bridge. There was six airplanes in the formation. The first one didn't have any flak. By the time we got there, they were ready for us. And we had quite a bit. And uh, I guess my most memorable thing is the four bursts right off our rudder. I could see them, one right after another, just bang, 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 and I thought, we're going to get it. <laughs> but we got out of there, and things went real good until we got back. That was uh, one of the longest missions. It was 15 and a half hours. At that time, our group had the longest mission of any flight mission in the history of flying until the B-29s come in. Then they took over. They could fly farther than we could. Uh, we left before daylight, and it was dark when we got back. And we were running out of fuel when we got back to the coast. And our pilot told us to get ready. We might have to go out. So we were all ready. And at that time, we found the uh, airport, Dum Dum Airport. There was a, there was a real overcast. And a hole opened up. I think but it was God there, I don't know what, but a hole opened up and there was the landing gear strip right below us. Wow. All lit up with, uh, they used uh, bonfires and stuff to light this thing up. We got in and stayed there overnight and then the next day we went back to our base. We went in at low level. We were only 300 feet off the ground. And uh, right after we dropped the bombs, and the pilot made a left-hand turn, and I spotted a train, locomotive, right off to my left. I wanted to get that thing to the head. I wanted it bad. But uh, when I swung the guns down, I couldn't get down far enough because it was in a bank to the left. So I looked over, and here was the compound below me, and it fell running around down there, and I could see the red fire coming from the guns. So I just swung around and I lit into them. We, then when we got out of the, halfway out of there, then we started getting the flak. And when we got out of that, I was glad. <laughs> <laughs> the movie was nothing like it. There was two bridges. One was a steel bridge. That's the one we took out. There was a wooden bridge, which is just a trussle. And that's all it was, just a trussle. It was uh, about a mile above us. Well, we took out the steel bridge, and in April, another group from our, another squadron from our group took out the wooden bridge. They lost an airplane in that one. They uh, got hit, and the co-pilot was wounded. They did get out to the coast and made a landing on the beach along the bay up at Akab, and they did get, get out. But one thing about it, when we went down over there, you didn't have much of a chance of ever getting out. Because either the Japs got you or the woods and jungle would get you. <laughs> and we never had any of them come back. So, like I said, all in all, I can't complain. Our base was actually an old English base. So, like I said, we had a pretty good. I had a little bit of harassment whenever I was in basic training. 
we had a few fellows from the Eastern Shore that didn't like us hillbillies back here. And they gave me a little bit of a bad time. But I finally settled that. Did you? I had a fight. <laughs> back in around the early 90s, I decided to try and locate my crew. I hadn't heard nothing but I'd seen my pilot once since that. When we were married, we met him when we was in Washington on our honeymoon. But nobody else I'd ever heard anything from. So around the middle of the 90s, I kind of got an urge to try and find them. It took me a year, but I finally located every one of them. Now there's only two of us left. Yeah, I found everybody, and uh, we corresponded for several years. But uh, as each one of them passed on, I mean, there's, there's just two of us left now. My closest buddy, he's in Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. We talk with him on the computer. Yeah. <laughs> What did you do after the service, after you were Well, I uh, went, uh, took a course of uh, machine and tool design on GI Bill. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I finished that, I went into drafting. Worked that for 20 years or so, and then went into a mechanical estimating mm -hmm. and uh, retired from that. Mm -hmm. I was uh, Very nice. glad to be home, I'll say that. <laughs> I'd have stayed in if I could have stayed on flying status, but uh, at that time the war was over and they they didn't have any that much use for yeah. that. So uh, I just went to the civil, civilian service and did what I could in there. Mm -hmm. So you really wanted to stay within the military, even if you were if, only if I could fly. Yeah. I mean, like I said, flying was a passion with me. <laughs> what do you think stirred that passion? Well, from the very beginning, I mean, when I was a boy, I, I, one of my best friends was flying, and uh, it's just a passion I had. And, uh, what did it feel like when you got up on the plane? Oh, nothing like it. <laughs> <laughs> I could go every day. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say war is good. <laughs> no, there's nothing good about it. Yeah. And. Uh, but I don't think we'll ever get rid of them. Mm -hmm. People can't get along, that's all there is to it. <laughs> How did your service and experiences affect your life in general? Well, I've never forgotten it, but I don't really dwell on it that much. Like I said, I didn't, that was as bad as a lot of fellows did. They had a lot more to worry about than I did. But uh, it's something I wouldn't give up. I mean, it's something I've forgotten, and I'll never, never forget it. After going under the Golden Gate Bridge, there you can see some of it back here. Well, we get out into the Pacific Ocean then, and this little blimp, they were called, they followed us out for so far. And then they turned around and went back, and we went on from then Barcel. And we went from there over to Australia. And we didn't have any other ships with us at all. Was all by herself. We went to New Guinea. It's a jungle island over there in the Pacific. There hadn't been many white men have ever been on New Guinea before, and it's it's all all jungle. There's no 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 civilization there as, as we know it at all. And the natives over there were, uh, oh, some of them have, their hair would be red and it'd be bushed way up all over. From, from New Guinea, and after things settled down there some, they decided to move on a little farther and they went, went to the, up to the northern part of New Guinea. After a few months, we were ready to 
move out again. And we went, that time we went from New Guinea. We didn't know where we were headed for when we left, but we were going to the Philippines then. That, that last, last night before we landed in the Philippines, there was, we saw, we thought it was heat lightning all around us, we could see. And, well, we didn't know, but what that was, there was a big naval battle going on. The Japanese fleet was coming out there, and if they had get through, well, they could, they could have sunk all those transports because uh, the armament that a transport has on is very little compared to these uh, bigger ships. Anyway, some, some of the United States fleet that was sitting there in Lady Gulf at that time were the ships that had been sunk at Pearl Harbor. And of course they had been repaired and were in use again. In fact, the battleship Maryland, we, we sailed right past it. It was just, you could have reached out and touched it. It was sitting, it was sitting there in the, in the bay, you know. But then that night, Though as the Japanese fleet moved in closer, they they uh, they moved into another position, and they that that's when they had the big naval battle out there. And uh, they uh, there was a lot of ships were sunk during that. Uh, and that was uh, one just planes. It was uh, ships actually shooting at each other. This one right here, that was the day after we first landed in the Philippines. And it was, of course, there was no place to stay or anything. You just had to, we just had those little tents that you'd carry on your back that you could set up and they was uh, they was only when they'd set up they was only about that high and then they down on the sides and anyway we went back they figured the next night would be better if we'd go out on the ship was that we'd come in on was still sitting there we'd be better if we go right on it again be on, stay on the ship instead of on the land where there's no place to stay. And then the, the next day, every, everything was pretty quiet and we, we, we still stayed on the ship. We didn't go on the land again. And along about 10 o'clock in the morning, the air raid alarm sounded and Japanese planes came in that day. I don't know just how many of them there was, but there was a lot of them. But uh, a lot, of, a lot of them got shot down, though. But uh, there was one. We could see it coming for a, a ways off from the ship. And that'd be this picture right here. And it had been hit. It was some flame burned from it. There was a tugboat tied up alongside of our boat. And uh, that plane dived right into that tugboat. And of course, our boat was right in back of it. And later that day, then they brought some landing boards just out and we get on that, get on them and we went back to the land again. At that time we stayed. <laughs> stayed there for a long time. But this ship here, after after it was hit, then it, it sat there in the bay for 
It was a long while. In fact, it might have been there yet when we left. I'm not sure. But uh, there was a hole in the side of that ship. You could drove, you could drove a big truck through it, where that that plane had hit it. Mission. Japanese planes took off. They they knew they weren't coming back. The first several months that we were over there, Japanese planes would come over, but they would they would drop bombs and try to hit ships. Later on, though, we would see these planes come in and, and they would go down, and we, as far as we could see, they they weren't even hit. And we didn't know what was going on. So after after a while, we caught on that they weren't shot down. They were diving in themselves. It, it was uh, a very a very scary thing. We we lost a lot of ships that way. Of course, after the plane would hit a ship, there wasn't much left of the plane. And in fact, nothing much at all. And then uh, uh, sometimes if one of those planes hit a ship, the ship didn't 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 sink. It, it wouldn't be damaged enough that it wouldn't still go. Of course, try and get out of the uh, try and stay out of the path of these planes if they could. And a lot of times, quite a few of those planes would leave their base. They come out after the ships, but a lot of them never got there because our Navy fighters and Air Force fighters too would get a lot of them, shoot a lot of them down before they got to the, where the ships were. That one over there is a, a ships in at the in at the dock they had there. Of course, they would start unloading supplies just as soon as they, as soon as they could, and sometimes, sometimes even after you were on the land, the planes would come over and they'd strafe. Now that is, uh, the flame planes fly not too high, and then they the machine gunners sort of fire down at the ground, you know. It, Troops or anything that might see that it'd be of military use. Now, low flying Japanese planes attack ships at dusk on Christmas Eve, December the 24th, 1944. Now, that was the last air raid we had. Well, they started to make preparations for the invasion of Japan. And then every day there'd be more ships you could see around were, were anchored all over the place. And one and we knew, we knew that another invasion was being planned and also that we were going to be a <laughs> part of it. But they'd send movies over them. I mean, movies before they'd be shown at the theaters around, they'd be shown to us. They'd send them out there so we could see them. <laughs> and uh, we were watching them movie this this one night. We we wouldn't have seats. Oh, we we'd have you'd find it empty gasoline can or, or a, maybe a log was around or something like that to sat on that was our seat. Anyway, we were we were watching the movie this night and I forget anymore what it was. And the somebody uh, up in the camp and he they uh, said that the war is over. 
we went back to our camp for that night. From then on, the uh, things changed quite a bit because we knew we wouldn't be over there much longer. And uh, although some some of the forces did go to Japan as the, the occupation force, but we didn't. I guess they figured we'd been over there long enough. And so after we we still was there a couple months or more waiting for the troop ships to come in. And finally one day they said that the ship was in and so in just a day or two we loaded up. And um, it was really, really glad to get back to seeing the Golden Gate again. It was the last thing we had seen on the way out. The first thing you recognize when you get back, when you come back in. But anyway, we could, as soon as we get into dock, everyone was glad to get off. Some of them fellas was come down the gangplank of that ship, and some of them were so glad to be back. They'd, some of them even knelt down and kissed the ground. They said they'd never leave again. <laughs> This first painting is the troop transport Fred C. Ainsworth leaving San Francisco in November 1943. Pilot boats for this painting take troop ships through Great Barrier Reef in the Brisbane, Australia, which was their first stop. This next painting is a convoy headed for New Guinea through the Coral Sea. Zeros attack a Liberty ship unloading offshore with a P-38 in pursuit. This is a large convoy going through the Philippines. Battleships in Lady Gulf, one of these was the USS Maryland. October 24th, 1944, the first attack by Japanese suicide kamikaze planes. Our ship, the Augustus Thomas, was hit. Tugboat alongside was the Sonoma sank also, LCI. Landing craft that is burning sank. Kamikaze attack on a Liberty ship carrying troops. There were many casualties. Betty bombers hit fuel dumps on Lady Island. Low-flying Japanese planes attacked ships at dusk on Christmas Eve, December 24, 1944. Lunar rainbow from the Tullacoma Dock. This is a night view of some of the Japanese invasion fleet. Early morning view of the fleet for invasion that never happened. Peace has returned to the Pacific at sunset one day in December 1945. Our troop ship starts home. These are some other views from Lady Island and Liberty ships. And Home at last, January 1946. Thanks be to God. My name is Alexander Ganyu, and people call me Al. And I was in the United States Army Air Corps in World War II. Somehow, as a kid, I liked airplanes. I, I used to watch airplanes. We had a, an airfield close to our home. I think it was about four or five miles away. We used to walk to the airport to see the airplanes. This is when I'm, this is, you guys realize this was 1932, 33, 34, that was a lifetime away. And, and I thought I wanted to fly airplanes and lo and behold, I did. So I guess I had enough mojo to become a pilot. I went through pilot training after that. The training involved primary flying school where I learned to fly a primary, the primary airplane was a, PT-17 made by Boeing, and uh, I remember one time the instructor, after I had soloed, he told me to go up and practice some Lazy 8s and Shondells. A Lazy 8 is a figure 8 like this, but you're, you're sort of banking the airplane into gentle turns. This teaches you how to keep the airplane running well and, uh, and uh, after I practiced that about two or three times, I thought, my golly, this is so monotonous. I took it up to 10,000 feet. It took me 55 minutes to get there. And after I flew around a little bit, I got back down by kicking in the left rudder, dumping the nose of the airplane, and letting, letting it spin down. You know, you get 
But that was fun for a 19 year old, you know oh, that. Geez. We got down in five minutes, or I got down in five minutes. 55 minutes up, five minutes down. And the instructor says, how'd you, how'd you like the flight today? I said, oh, it was great. Did you do some lazy, oh yeah, I did a couple lazy eights in the shot. I didn't tell him that I <laughs> spun the airplane down. And uh, when I finished, uh, the advanced flying school was in March, March 24th, 1944. I got my wings and I became a second lieutenant as a 20 year old. That's not bad for a kid. Yeah. <laughs> Ben. We finished our combat crew training and they sent us back to Lincoln, Nebraska, picked up a new airplane, and I flew it overseas. Around midnight, and we went into the uh, CQ's office, and our name was on a board that says we're going to fly our first mission. And uh, this was on October the 16th, 1944. Well, the excitement of seeing your name on there made us hurry and go to bed, which we did. And I think it was about an hour and a half later, they woke us. We had to start getting ready to go on our first flight, and we were briefed by the officer in charge, and we were to go to Cologne, Germany. And he said, whatever you do, stay away from the cathedral. They had a world-famous cathedral in Germany. And, uh, when the war was nearing the end, I had a friend that went through Cologne and he said, the only thing standing in Cologne, Germany was the church. But he said it had a lot of pot marks on it from shells and bullets and what have you. The Germans had cannons from the ground. They called them flak guns. He shortened it to F-L-A-K, flak. And this is nothing but a bomb bursting in there. It's an explosion like this, and the explosion causes little particles of metal to fly out. And these things hit the airplane, and if there's enough of them, and if they hit in a critical spot, they cause damage. But like I said, I can't remember any mission where they, somebody wasn't shooting. As a matter of fact, on that first mission to Cologne, we're flying out, I, we're flying up at about anywhere from 24 to 30,000 feet. And you look, at, there's nothing but blue sky above you. There may be clouds underneath you and you can't see the ground. And you're looking out and all of a sudden you see burst of black out here, burst over here. And then when you see enough of these, you begin to realize that's what that is. They're shooting at us. That's flat. Well, the first time you go, you see this. And then after that, you don't want to even go close to where that is. You, you want to try to avoid it. I didn't think I felt afraid, but I had a feeling after I realized what was happening to my body, which I had no control over. And excuse my wording if I don't say it right, but you know what the body does when you have stress. Your kidneys don't function right and it causes you to go to the bathroom. And we had a tube underneath our seat and it was literally a funnel that we went to the bathroom in. And one time I remember my, my ball turret, you realize on this airplane there was this round contraption underneath the middle of the airplane. He had two guns and he could move that around. He could make it go this way, this way, and every way. Well, he sat in there huddled up, his knees almost in his chest. I can't do it anymore old and this is the way he sat he had his foot on pedals and he controlled the airplane by moving the pedals he controlled the guns he had a little on, the, on his right foot he had a clip come across and that was the the microphone that he could talk to anybody on the ship anyway <laughs> this one day when I went to the bathroom he called me and he said hey Al I wish you wouldn't go to the bathroom or if you're gonna have to let me know and I'll turn my back on you because the, the, the stuff came out of the tubes and it hit his windshield and it froze on there. <laughs> the first time we lost an engine, the crew got worried because they didn't know whether we were gonna be able to land right or not because we only had three engines. And even though you practice in training to do this, it's not the same as when it actually happens. So I told them, if you're gonna worry about not being able to land, go back there and get in the crash position where you, 
get your back against the wall. You're, if you're flying that way, you turn your back to the wall with the way you're flying. And you idle down and you push against another wall if you can't slip it. You don't move around. There's no way to tie you down in there unless you're in the pilot or co-pilot seat. They're the only ones that had seat belts. Everybody else was standing or whatever. They all got into this position in, uh, uh, after a little while, somebody called up and says, when are we gonna land? I said, we've been on the ground for five minutes, but I made one of the best landings ever, and they didn't even know it that we were already on the ground. It was so smooth. The only metal I have is an air metal with uh, six, six clusters. You get, a, you get a, an air metal for five missions, and you get a cluster for every five missions. So I had 35 missions, so I got uh, a medal and six clusters. The war was over in May the 9th, 1945. Coming back from overseas is memorable. You're safe, you didn't get shot down. You, you weren't hurt. And I was gonna surprise my sister and my mother. And I decided, no, I better not. So I called my sister, my sister said, where are you? I said, I'll be home in 15 minutes. <laughs> everybody in the city was celebrating and I had a hard time getting through the crowd because everybody wanted to grab me and hug me because I was one of the few people close by that had, had seen combat. So uh, I had a beautiful time. I'm sorry to say that I do know that my bombardier and I are the only other two that are left. Two years ago, the three of us got together well, we hadn't seen each other in quite a while, so I called my bombardier and I called my waste gunner in Phoenix and I said, why don't we get together in Denver? I'll fly out and the waste gunner in, in Phoenix drove up and the three of us met at the bombardier's house in Denver. We were together for four days and we had such a good time reminiscing about our experiences and the waste gunner was only 17 when he went in. I was 19, and the bombardier was 19. And I tell everybody, those four days we won the war all over again. These are the best years of your life. Take a hold of it and use it to your advantage. You're gonna have families, you're gonna go to school, you're gonna make money, and it works. And this is the greatest country in the world and you have the most opportunities. Go with it.